Thank you so much for that nice intro. It was, uh, it's great to be here and honestly really exciting to talk about security as a feature today. Um, we're gonna to be going through a few different ideas uh, in this concept in terms of why companies might not think of uh, security as a feature. Of course, what they do think of as a feature first uh, and then going into what happens when they don't. Uh, but also, of course, some of the good things that can come from thinking of security like a feature, uh, going ahead and then how you can implement that within your tool chain or your process, uh, some further learning, and, uh, and we'll take it from there. So let's go ahead and dive right in. This is going to be great. Um, so first of all, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, so at a high level, uh, of course, I am, uh, as the intro says there, the Senior Manager of Application Experience here at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, I'm responsible for the teams that make up the largest enterprise applications that we have here at Thermo Fisher, including uh, the conference office and service technologies teams, um, which do an excellent job uh, themselves keeping the business running, especially during uh, the situation that we're in with the global pandemic. Really uh, hats off to them in terms of all of the great work that they're doing to keep us moving forward. Uh, in a past life here at Thermo Fisher Scientific, I was the senior manager of global DevSecOps. I built the DevSecOps and application security program from the ground up, uh, which is a, a really great challenge and experience. Uh, and it's funny because I am on record as saying DevSecOps doesn't exist, but uh, and then it became my title. And so uh, I kind of had to adopt it and really embrace it and, and since have. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself and the perspective that I bring to this conversation. Uh, so formerly, I hosted the Application Security Weekly podcast starting back in 2018 with Paul Asadorian, episodes uh, 00 to 55, because we start from counting at zero uh, in the dev world. Uh, I was a rank 65 bug crowd, uh, bug bounty hunter back in 2018 and an MVP. Uh, and when I'm writing some code, I really love to jump into Visual Studio Code. It's a, a great platform for those of you that haven't had a chance to jump in and, and get your feet wet. Uh, personally, I love writing in Python and Bash. JavaScript is something I'm still trying to pick up. Golang is another favorite of mine when I get an opportunity. Uh, and there are a couple of projects I want to highlight. I did start the InfoSec Mentors project or restarted it really and made it open source. Um, and then, of course, I'm working on another project that's private currently called the Secure Functions Project, but will eventually be released open source once it's uh, ready for the world to embrace. Uh, think of it more like an object relational mapper for security uh, in terms of the way that you can put security into your code and some of those sensitive functions that you, that you build on. Uh, that said, uh, some of my hobbies I love to read. Uh, I can always recommend books, and I'll have some here for you today. Uh, writing is something that I enjoy doing on occasion, and then gaming, uh, Breath of the Wild, Legend of Zelda is a favorite of mine right now. Uh, and of course, during times when we're not in COVID, I love to travel. Can't wait to get back to Japan and say uh, ohayou gozaimasu to all my friends out there in, in Japan. Uh, so let's jump in. So first of all, you know what makes something a feature, right? That's something that is is often uh, discussed in, in concerning uh, the project management or product management team, the dev teams. They always say, well, that's not really a feature. Security is not a feature. Uh, and, and that's because, of course, features are things that customers ask you for, right? They're the things that people want to see, the things that um, people will complain about if they don't have it in your application. And so therefore, they'll tell you about it. Uh, then, of course, there's resources in terms of people, time, or money. Uh, those are things that get allocated to features. Whatever you're allocating your people, your money, and your time to, those are the features you're working on, whether you're calling, calling them a feature or not. Uh, and then features, well, generally speaking, if you build it, you're going to make sure that it's regularly tested. You're going to make sure that it works the way that you want it to, uh, and you're going to make sure that it continues to get enhanced over time. Uh, generally speaking, you're not going to uh, take a feature out unless, of course, it's just really not used or uh, it's so totally broken that it's it's not worth continuing and working on. Um, but otherwise, you're going to make that thing better. And those are the features uh, that your company is investing in. So why isn't security considered a feature? Uh, and this is kind of an interesting topic because uh, one of the things that I'll often ask dev teams after they've done some security review of their applications is I'll say, do you have a banking app on your phone? Uh, now, that doesn't always translate depending on where you are in the world. Some cash-heavy cultures don't really use banking applications. Might do e-commerce, but um, I'll ask a dev, are, are you using some, some sort of financial transaction application on your phone? And the answer is almost universally yes. Well, um, one of the questions that you should be asking is, would you use it if it had the vulnerabilities that your application has? And that's when you know security is a feature because it's not something that people were asking you for, but it was something that you and the, and the people using your applications are expecting. Uh, in a lot of ways, I like to say this is kind of like the faucet that you go to or the sink that you may go to. And when you turn that left knob, you expect the water to be hot. That's universally true. You didn't have to ask anyone for it and you didn't have to tell the plumber to install it that way. It's just the way that that operates. And so in a lot of ways, that's the way that people think of security today is it's one of those utilities that you just expect it to be there and expect it to work uh, as intended. 
Of course, uh, you will give money and time to security, but uh, generally not as a feature. You'll do it when there's a bomb about to go off in terms of some vulnerability in uh, a dependency or in your code base uh, that's been uncovered, or if those bombs have already exploded. Uh, you're going to spend time and money on those things to very quickly fix them, and it tends to be very disruptive when you do that. Uh, unfortunately, when that happens, uh, you're going to be disrupting all of the other features that your customers have asked you for that they're outwardly expressing that they want. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, security is often tested, but not reliably and not necessarily by people that you want to be testing those applications. Um, there are some examples that I have here in a couple of slides, but I like to think of this like cellular service. You expect it to work and it's often tested, but yeah, it's not always reliable and it's not always working the way that you want it to. Well, I hate to tell you, but if you have an application that's publicly facing to the internet or an application that people can download uh, from the internet, it's probably being tested. And uh, people may or may not tell you about it, and they may use it for nefarious purposes, which is unfortunate, but it's one of those reasons why we need to take security seriously. So of course, what happens when you don't take security seriously? What are those things that occur in the world uh, as a result of that? Well, first of all, vulnerabilities continue to pile up. Uh, if you don't fix one vulnerability, you're probably going to lead to a chain of vulnerabilities, multiple vulnerabilities. It's it's a challenge. Uh, a good example of that is unfortunately Capital One. They had a breach due to uh, uh, basically a lack of security in the implementation of some of their applications. And due to cultural challenges, they lost uh, a number of very talented people because of the insecurity and the way that their culture really thought about security inside the workplace. Now, uh, from the fines themselves, it was estimated to cost about 150 million US dollars uh, for them to pay for all of the different fines and regulations that they got struck with. Um, but the total cost of the company in terms of buying all those security tools, hiring new staff, upgrading all of their applications was estimated over 500 million US dollars. Uh, that's a lot of money that they could have been investing in other ways, or they, they could have made smaller investments in security and been a lot better off over the long term as a result of that. You also see vulnerabilities leading to bad publicity. A uh, key example of that is Uber. Uh, back in the day, and this is not too long ago, there was a data breach of over 100,000 US dollars that was paid out via a bug bounty program uh, that they ended up losing their CSO, our chief security officer over because of course it was seen as a cover up. And that chief security officer is now being brought up on criminal charges as a result of trying to cover up uh, the breach event. It was really unfortunate, both for, for Uber who does generally a pretty good job of security and well, quite frankly, for all of their customers uh, that were caught up in all of that. And then finally, of course, there's Zoom. Now, Zoom is a great product, and they're one of those companies that uh, is used universally to try and get us through the situation that we're in today. Um, but here's the challenge. These global pandemic situations happen, hopefully, once in a lifetime when you see these situations where the company can actually transform the way that their business operates and the, the market uh, kind of capture that they can actually realize as a result of being a superior product in the marketplace. Unfortunately for them, they had some end-to-end -end encryption challenges that were brought forward right as this all kicked off. And of course, then they had some security vulnerabilities that were piled on top. Now they've rushed to hire a chief security officer and bring in security as uh, new feature sets in their application. They could have avoided that and actually captured a great bigger part of the market share out there in the world uh, if they had actually considered security a feature from the get-go. And now their competitors have caught up and in some cases are stealing that market share that they could have grabbed. And it doesn't have to be this way. Quite frankly, there are a number of things that we can do as developers and as security professionals to make our applications more secure. I like to think of this as the broken windows theory when it comes to security as linting. Back in the 1990s, we had challenges when it came to uh, really crime happening in New York City here in the United States. It was continuing to rise. It was rampant and, and almost universal within the city. And one of the uh, psychological theories around this was because of broken windows and graffiti uh, found throughout the city, especially in subway cars and their uh, kind of public transit systems. One of the ways they fixed that they actually took those subway cars out of production. They repainted them and then sent them back into the production as that paint was drying so that they could show that the city really cared about uh, the people that lived there and the public transit systems that they were investing in. So in the same way, we should do that within our code when it comes to finding those dangerous functions like dangerously uh, set HTML, uh, for example, within the React framework. And of course, establishing coding standards can help us be a little bit more precise about making sure that we uh, maintain the code base and make sure that it's groomed on a regular basis to be healthy and clean. 
And then, of course, there's security, security as unit testing. When we think about the tomatoes and the tomato sauce, uh, I like to say, check your recipe and check your ingredients. And by checking your recipe, I mean static analysis, going ahead and taking a look at your code to make sure that you're not inserting any sort of vulnerable functions or uh, calling things in a way that you really shouldn't be, such as calling directly to your SQL database as opposed to using an object relational mapper. And then checking your ingredients, dependency check uh, or dependency, dependency checking. It's one of those tool sets that can really help you understand that the ingredients that you're putting into your applications are fresh, that they're continuously being updated, and that they're actually going ahead and solving some of those problems that you're seeing when it comes to the vulnerabilities. Uh, at the end of the day, if you make a great recipe with rotten ingredients, it's going to turn out pretty bad for your health and, of course, for uh, anyone that's trying to consume that. And then I like to think of, uh, finally, that throwing, uh, throwing spaghetti at the wall in terms of integration testing. Uh, so that's that whole idea of making sure things stick. So, uh, of course, you can do that with web applications today using dynamic analysis. I have a couple of recommendations here in terms of some tools that you can uh, go ahead and use to do that. But making sure that you're actually checking the inputs that you're throwing into your code to make sure that your application is reacting in uh, safe and secure ways. And then for compiled applications, there's fuzzing. Basically, again, it's that throwing spaghetti at the, uh, at the wall to see if it sticks or throwing a bunch of inputs at your code see what your application does when you throw it something that it's not really anticipating. So there are a lot of ways that we can solve this problem when it comes to treating security as a feature as we develop. And then, of course, there are benefits to treating security as a feature. A good example of that is attack complexity increases. One of the things that I like to think about here is why are phishing attacks still so prevalent? because people fall for them, first of all, and because uh, the more complex attacks are really expensive. We can look at the zero day market when it comes to things like uh, iOS or Android vulnerabilities that are out there today where you've had zero days to apply a patch or implement security. And quite frankly, those costs are going up. And that's a good thing because what that ends up meaning is that the attacker ends up being a very small subset of the world's uh, landscape. It ends up being state uh, actors as opposed to cheeky kids on the internet, for an example. Uh, and so that way your application will be a little bit more robust and quite frankly, uh, you're outrunning a majority of the bears. Of course, it also differentiates your project or your product. If you think about Apple, for example, uh, they're almost universally known for a lot of the security and privacy implementations that they've put in place. We can also look at examples within the uh, software development landscape, such as React versus AngularJS. Back in the day, AngularJS, the original uh, version of it, had a sandbox, and that sandbox had a lot of escapes, and it led to a lot of vulnerabilities, such as remote code execution or even a full remote reverse shell. Uh, I've taught a couple trainings that have shown exactly how this works, and thankfully, Google has addressed that with later versions of Angular, such as by removing the sandbox in the original AngularJS because people were using it wrong. Uh, and in this way, if we think of security as a feature from the get-go, we can actually write on secure frameworks and languages like Rust to eliminate a vast majority of the vulnerabilities that enter our landscape. And of course, once you go ahead and invest in security as a feature, it allows you to save time and money. It's that return on investment, that compounding interest that allows you to actually go ahead and focus on other investments and experimentation so that you can grab more market share uh, and, of course, differentiate your product uh, and then pay down those other technical debts that you might be encountering. So uh, where to get started, right? How can we actually start implementing these things? And I always like to say, of course, people are probably the most important thing within your organization. The next most important thing is that process. And you have to think about a few things. First of all, what speed of development do you need to actually be hitting? Are you a web application that needs to have sub millisecond or rather, excuse me, sub second or millisecond deployments? Uh, or are you building a product that has a I don't know, six month release cycle, and it doesn't need to be patched right away because it's not connected to the internet or it's not supposed to be connected to the internet. Uh, that's really going to shape how you think about solving security problems. A really good example of that is thinking about how fast you might fix a problem if it was impacting your revenue generation in some way, such as being able to have people go through a checkout process. If you react faster than uh, security for that thing because it's impacting your revenue, you probably should think about how you can actually make security react faster as well in terms of implementing them as part of that process. And then of course, think of your breadth of testing. You wanna be considerate about not only how much are you actually covering your code with unit tests and integration tests that follow that happy path, but work with your security team to think about how you can follow the unhappy path. Throw the things at your application that it's not expecting or that it would should handle gracefully or would uh, otherwise avoid falling over because of the unhappy or malicious unit tests that you're throwing at it. And then, of course, think about that mean time to resolution. Measure, of course, how fast it 
can take you to solve some of the problems within your code base that are very traditional bugs impacting your day-to-day -day users. And then think about how fast you can react to your security vulnerabilities. If they're going to the backlog and living there forever and never getting resolved, you probably are going to encounter an issue at some point in the history of your application as a result of those vulnerabilities that are going unaddressed. So measure it and then bring it forward to your leadership to make sure that it gets addressed on a regular basis. Which gets to the last point, of course, which is allocating time for technical debt. I like to say that if you allocate time to fix those things uh, periodically, fix the broken windows, paint the walls, change, uh, change the drapes, it allows you, in this case, to improve your code over time, making the house worth living in and the neighborhood a better place for your customers to live in. Uh, so if you allocate about 20% time for technical debt over time, you're going to end up being able to release faster, to have better testing and resolve problems quicker. It pays itself in the long term. And then, of course, in terms of some tools that you can use, I like to say with static analysis, GitHub's advanced security tool set is phenomenal. Their acquisition of SEML is light years ahead of other products in the space. And I say that from being a code security engineer at Veracode in a past life. It is one of those tools that can really make a difference in your code base. And I strongly encourage any open source project to check that out. And then if you have Ruby as your main code base, uh, Breakman, great tool, open source. It's publicly available. I think they now have a paid version, but also a free version. And then SoderCube is another uh, great one as well from a static analysis perspective to give you some, some ideas on things you can do. And then from dynamic analysis, the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP, has the Z Attack Proxy, or ZAP that electric uh, symbol that you see there. Great dynamic analysis tool, has an API functionality to it, is free, uh, and is something I strongly encourage people to check out and start using regularly just to see what happens. Again, throw that spaghetti at your code and see what sticks. Uh, then there's W3AF by Andreas Riancho, who is another uh, great developer who has provided a, a nice dynamic analysis attack tool set, really great for Java and other tools, uh, which are very common in the enterprise today. Dependency checking, again, making sure that you check the ingredients uh, as well as of the static analysis recipe. Dependabot, really great tool if you're on the GitHub platform, which I would think that you probably are if you're watching this. Uh, and then, of course, OWASP's dependency check tool uh, if you need another thing to go ahead and look into the environment and make sure that things are working appropriately and that the libraries you're using are fresh and secure. And then secrets management, making sure that you're actually dealing with those problems of uh, committing secrets to your code by understanding how that works and making sure that uh, people understand how to use the secrets vault that you're using. Of course, CyberArk Conjure also has another solution in the space, and I strongly recommend you check it out. And then uh, for further learning, I strongly recommend these three books to just about anyone that I talk to. The DevOps Handbook is something that every individual contributor, whether you're a developer or a project manager or someone that's working with a, a software product in some way, should read front to back, because it will cover pretty much every use case that you can think of, including part six, which is about security, uh, which is why I often say DevSecOps is the buzzword today, but it's really just part of DevOps. It's always been part of the DevOps handbook, and it's something that I encourage a lot of people to go read. Uh, for those people that are either in the manager's path or uh, in terms of their career or are looking to get into management, I strongly encourage Camille Fournier's book, The Manager's Path, uh, largely because it brings that human element to the problems that we deal with. It thinks about, of course, making sure that you're not burning yourself out or your teams out. Uh, and it talks through kind of every level from a lead engineer all the way through CTO on what your world will look like as a result of moving down that path in your career. And then finally, for those leaders that are watching, I strongly, strongly encourage reading Lean Enterprise. It is one of those books that will bring forward in the first half of the book, a lot of the ideas that you see in the DevOps handbook. But in the second half, it's pure gold. It will talk through a lot of the different challenges that you're going to experience. And then, of course, how to slowly break them down and rethink about the way that you're going to address them and then move forward and build a better enterprise as a result. And finally, I just want to say thank you to a few people that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, first and foremost is my lovely wife, Sarah. Uh, she is really the light of my life, and I'm, I'm very blessed to have her as a part of it, and especially living in such interesting times as these. She has been a continued light. Uh, and encouraging me to do things like this and continuing to move forward. Uh, and then, of course, there's my good friend and my sensei, Jason Haddix, who has taught me an incredible amount about uh, not only information security and web application hacking, but about being a good human being. And Jason is absolutely just one of the very best that I know. Uh, and then finally, there's my good buddy at GitHub, Adam Matthews. A huge shout out and thank you to Adam, of course, for recommending that I get involved in this, uh, but also for encouraging me to continue to rethink about the way that 
GitHub can make changes in the enterprise and make it better and allowing uh, us here at Thermo Fisher to engage with the team there at GitHub and making sure that they hear of all the things that we'd really love to do. Uh, so with that, as I always used to end my podcast, I just want to remind everyone to get commit and stay classy. <laughs>